purpose drives achievement. And my purpose happens to be in the room with us here today. I've been writing about, speaking about, talking about this guy for the last four years. He's in town because we're going to run together on Sunday down in Monterey along the ocean, a full half marathon, and have almost raised $5,000 for the Multimyeloma Research Foundation. Yes. So I wanted Jeff to come in and have a chance to share his story. He is living with multiple myeloma. He is a survivor, and he's my brother. And I am proud to introduce him to share his story with you this morning. Put your hands together for Jeff. Go. Wonderful to be here, and 16 years ago, I joined David for what it was at the point, his first or second, or maybe it was a couple of months into Toastmasters, and it's um, amazing to see him now, what's, what's transpired as a result of his uh, coming to Toastmasters. Um, I'm going to apologize in advance for referring to my notes because what I found, I've spoken to a number of um, groups before marathons, uh, multiple myeloma research foundation sponsors, endurance teams for marathons, half marathons, and I've been honored to speak to a lot of these groups the day before the race. And this is a different kind of group, an imposing group because of your uh, what Toastmasters is about. So I'm honored and humbled to speak in front of folks that's all about speaking and communicating. So I feel the critique factor of professionalism <laughs> all around me. And nothing but love. Nothing but love. That's right. So my story is about um, surviving and thriving. And as David mentioned, um, I am uh, four and a half years ago, I was diagnosed with uh, multiple myeloma. It's a bone marrow cancer. It's crazy rare, it represents less than 1% of all cancers, and it falls under the leukemia lymphoma umbrella. Very few people have heard of it, know what it, what it is, unless you have an aunt, an uncle, a mother, a father, and then all of a sudden you get very tuned in as to um, what it's all about. So, I've been an athlete all of my life, and so this is that funny yeah. curveball where yeah. it's like, <laughs> cue the snowblower, or in this case, the grass clipper guy outside, right? Yeah. <clears throat> My youth was consumed with basketball, football, baseball, track. Um, it's really my identity as a kid growing up was all about sports. And the, um, the feeling of invincibility that comes with sports and all the things that go along with that. And after college, I added to those existing activities uh, sailing and soccer and uh, backpacking and trekking to some pretty remote places. I'm a big outdoorsman. And again, it was all about the physical exertion, physical activity, and that really defined who I saw myself as. When someone would say, you know, who are you? I'm an athlete, I'm an outdoorsman, I'm a sportsman. And oh yeah, then came the marathons. More about that later. So it was no surprise four and a half years ago on a chilly Chicago morning, I was on the lakefront. It was the first 16 inch softball game of the season. For those of you that wonder, 16 inch softball? Yes, it's a very Chicago thing. Baseball and softball is a sport that's, in the rest of the world, is played with a bat, a ball, and a glove. Not in Chicago. 16-inch softball is this gigantic pumpkin-looking thing that was founded right after World War II. Some guys that had a bat and a ball, they couldn't afford baseball gloves. So they came up with this thing that's just your hands, just a ball, manly sport for these factory and steel workers. Well, it's still played today. And this was the first game of the season. Interestingly, this is on the tail end of a father and son's fishing trip. Um, 
Um, my dad, Jim Goat, has four boys. I'm the oldest of four. Quite a handful, if you can imagine, two more of us. Yeah. <laughs> and we were on a muskie trip for a weekend. And um, it's a very physically demanding activity. And David had come in from California. I just dropped him off at the airport, flying back downtown Chicago for my softball game. So this evening it's cold on the lakefront, and I was a little, just your muscles are tight. You're not very loose. And I was pitching that night, so I wasn't prepared. Or I guess I was a little fatigued, and I just wasn't ready for um, that kind of activity, that cold, that time of the night. But five years ago, four and a half years ago, things did change dramatically for me, all in the swing of a softball bat. Little did I know that my journey would touch so many people, many of you here in the room, and that it would transform my sense of purpose in such a monumental way. Last month I celebrated my 15th anniversary with my amazing wife, Ramona, who's on a plane coming here uh, later today. And she's grown accustomed to all these sports and activities, as well as my occasional injury. So she came up with a really clever phrase that she would say every time I walked out the door to go on a multi-day sailing trip, or a trekking, or a fishing trip, or a hunting trip, and it was always this, HFDGH, have fun, don't get hurt. <laughs> she signs many cards, little notes she'll leave in my bags when I get to my destination, have fun, don't get hurt. So when I came through the door that night, after my softball game, she could tell by the sound of my cleats on the, on the floor that something was wrong. My normal walk through the door, drop my stuff, was a little... I thought I'd pull the muscle in my back. That's what I told her. I think I pulled a muscle in my back, I'm going to be okay. Little did I know that I'd be off to the hospital the next morning after I was barely able to walk and get out of bed, I had to crawl to the bathroom. <clears throat> after four hours of x-rays and exams from my Doogie Hauser looking emergency room doctor. <laughs> that dates us in the room, right? If you know the room. <laughs> yes, that same little charming guy who is the rambunctious Barney on how I met my mother. So Doogie proclaims, Mr. Goad, you'll be just fine. Take these pain pills and you'll be okay in a couple of days. Famous words. Young guy to a weekend warrior, right? Everything's going to be fine. But over the years, I've become very attuned to my body through the activities that I've had and the injuries I've had, so I know when something's right and when something's wrong. And I could tell something was wrong. So after no improvement over a couple of days, I called my regular doctor and says, go get an MRI. We need, let's get a little further look at this. And I'd known my doctor, for Dr. Rapazzi, for almost 20 years. And what had become really enjoyable was I'd go get my test, and a few days later I'd get the call, everything's great, see you next year. Wonderful words. So, when the call came from the office and said, you know, hey, you know, how's it going? He goes, can you and Ramona come down to my office? I want to talk to you about your test. Obviously, things change in a tone, and you can tell there's something hanging in the air, and he wants to tell us in person, not over the phone. So in his office, it became a blur of words. The room shrinks down until the words multiple myeloma came out of his mouth. I didn't know what it was. All I knew was Oma. We grew up in a household where our mom was a nurse. 
medical comp phrases and just health in general was commonplace. We understood um, all the medical world. So it almost stuck out in our minds. He described what it was. My wife and I, neither one of us had heard of it before. And he finished up the, our meeting with, you've got an appointment in three hours with a specialist. This was serious. The normal marker for all of us in the room, everybody has different levels of proteins, and three is normal. My marker was 1,400. I was in advanced stage three of multiple myeloma. Today, as I stand here in front of you, though, it's five. In addition to the, one of my favorite phrases of drinking from the fire hose was the flurry of research. The internet is a cruel mistress. There's lots of information, lots of misinformation. It's very difficult to synthesize and to digest what that all means. But the bottom line was the most important first statement that our doctor gave to us was, you're going to get through this, and the way you're going to do this is find a way every day, find something to be thankful for. Every single day, find one thing, and you'll eventually build a fabric of things, affirmations, that'll keep you going. So, a summer of chemo. Two stem cell transplants, one in October, another one in March. Two times losing all my hair. I wasn't quite as charming looking as Steve is over here. <laughs> but I know what I'll look like in the future. Eh. And I'm currently taking a maintenance chemo pill just to keep myeloma at bay. So, where's Marathon fit in all this? Marathon became my recovery plan. On a bet, actually on a dare, 25 years ago, as a 27-year-old, I'd never run anything more than a 5 or 10K race. A friend said, you know there's a Chicago Marathon. Give it a try. I ran that at age 27. There was 7,000 of us at the starting line. It's now a 45,000 person event. Huge magnitude. But marathon training is about incremental gains, having a goal on the horizon, and taking the steps along the way to get there. You can't start off running 13 miles. You can't start off losing 50 pounds at once. It's incremental. You have to do the little things along the way. And in a way, it also taught me how to suffer. It taught me how to be uncomfortable. It taught me how to stretch and push your limits. And you don't know what you can do until you've been uncomfortable, until you push yourself into the hurt zone. And in a variety of ways, whether it's emotional, physical, you have to push yourself in order to know what you're capable of doing versus saying, wow, that's just too much, that's too far, that's something I can't achieve. And the marathon training gave me my sense of recovery, how I was going to achieve it, because when I came home from the hospital, from the stem cell transplant, I was weak as a kid. I could barely walk up the two flights of steps to my condo, yet the next day I told my wife, I want to try to walk around the block. I went out, I got about halfway, had to cut through the alley and came back. Flopped on the couch, passed out. And the next day, I went out and I was able to complete my whole first lap around my block. The next day, a little further, a little further. Into the first week, I'd actually walk the mile. My follow-up appointment with my doctor said, so how you feeling? I said, well, I was able to walk a mile. And she looked at me and she says, what's wrong with you? She goes, <laughs> most people come back and said, I was able to do the laundry today. And that was their sense of accomplishment. You're out there walking a mile. What's, but she knew my history, she knew me as a, as a marathon runner, she knew I wasn't content. 
I was desperately seeking a way to get back to normal. And the only way to do that was to go out and work at it. To go out and work at it. So what were a couple of the lessons from this? I can tell you that there's an extremely clarifying moment when you're given life-threatening news. All the things that were trivial in Chicago, it's, what do we complain about? Well, I couldn't find parking today. The train was so full, I had to wait for another train. I was six minutes late to the office. I couldn't, this lady in the line at the dry cleaner was telling the story and on and on and on. All of a sudden, when you get this clarifying moment, you broom the table. It's very crystal clear what's important and what's not important. And it's on, I will say, don't wait until you have one of these life-threatening scenarios to decide for you and your life what's important and what's not important. The people in your life that are important, give them extra time. The people that aren't important, let them fall away. You have to earn and give and nurture the things that are important because they'll give back to you. And that comes in the form of people, the time you spend, what you do, where you go. Do the things that bring you joy. In our life, with my wife, that's traveling, hiking, camping, backpacking, being out of nature, doing, getting away from the city, doing the things that bring us joy. That was an extremely important piece. In my recovery therapies, I think about in two weeks, I'm going to be able to go on a fly fishing trip. I'm going to be standing in a stream, being able to cast. And so often, just the therapy of being able to have enough strength to be in the water to do something that I love. We all have things that we love. Those things give us joy. They give us energy. They give us our own personal inspiration. So for all of you that have that thing in your life that you love, make sure you do whatever you can do to continue to do that for yourself, but look at your family and friends. Is there someone who's challenged, who's not able to do something that you know brings them great joy? Help them get to that joy. Help them through a conversation. If it's someone, a family member, help them through, be an advocate for them with their, with their doctor. Talk to them about, they just don't have the energy. They just don't have the strength. Do you need to modify their medicine a little bit? Be involved be an advocate to maintain the things that bring you joy, your family, your friends, they will absolutely benefit in, in immeasurably instead of just sitting back and taking what is given to you. And on a, my own personal inspiration from this whole journey, What has touched me the most, and it's interesting, after four and a half years, my first, I was unable to talk about it the first year to a group of people. And it still to this day is difficult emotionally because of the absolute immense gratitude that I feel through the generosity of complete strangers. Some of you in this room. We donated money to our races. I didn't know who you were. Why would someone, complete stranger, Tracy, want to donate money to a cause for a guy in Chicago? That feeling of gratitude is immeasurable and inspiring to me. Not to mention the inspiration that I feel from my brother's wacky adventures, <laughs> roller skating, wearing a cape, um, those kinds of things continue to inspire me of what he was willing to do for me, for the cause. And then lastly, I really want to thank the Toastmasters. Why would I want to thank the Toastmasters? Because you individually, 
you as a group, you as an organization, have immeasurably shaped this guy in the back of the room and transformed his life in a way that would have never happened. His sense of confidence, his speeches, his competitions, Toastmasters as a group has shaped him in a way that has benefited me beyond my wildest expectations. So I want to thank you as a group, the organization, and my awesome brother Dave. Thank you.